There is no substitute for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Each weekday on Enjoying the Journey, Scott Pauley leads us in a brief study of Scripture. Today, on the Weekend Pulpit, we are happy to share a full-length Bible message given through Scott's pulpit ministry. These messages were recorded live in a local church or gospel event in recent days. It is our prayer that the message will be a help to you today. When I finish preaching tonight, I'm going to ask you to identify something. Really, I'm not going to ask you to identify it. I'm going to ask you to agree with what the Holy Spirit identifies. And you say, well, what is that thing? I have absolutely no idea. I have no idea. I'm sure you think, you know, when preachers come, they come with, with an agenda. And we try to be in step with the Holy Spirit. But I don't know. I really don't know what it is God's going to do in your heart tonight. I'm convinced of this. When we open the Word of God, God will do something. Something definite, something spiritual, something personal. But I don't know what that thing will be. And I think sometimes as preachers, we speak in such generalities and we, we preach to an audience of people. But I'm, I'm more convinced than ever that the Holy Spirit has a way of taking the truth of the Word of God and connecting it to every human being that's open to the truth in a very distinct and personal way. And what I'm going to ask you to do when I finish preaching tonight is whatever that thing is, and you'll understand in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to bring that to the Lord. Years ago, I was reading the story of F.B. Meyer. How many of you know F.B. Meyer? Yes? Not personally. He's been in heaven for a while, but we know his writings. And F.B. Meyer was a man tremendously, tremendously used of God. I love his books. I just can't wait to meet him in heaven. You ever think about all the people you're going to meet when you get to heaven someday? And one night, early on in his ministry, he was well-known already and well-respected. He attended a meeting where a young man got up and gave a testimony. You know, there are these moments, could even be on a Monday evening. Did you know God actually does work on Monday evenings? There are these moments in life where the Lord makes appointments for you you could never have made for yourself. He came into a meeting, and there was a young man giving a testimony that night by the name of C.T. Studd. Anybody know the name C.T. Studd? And in his day, C.T. Studd would, would be like me saying the name of a famous NBA player or NFL star because C.T. Studd was the most famous, well-known cricket player in all of England at the time. He was an amazing athlete, could have spent the rest of his life just living off of his good name. And C.T. Studd had gone to a D.L. Moody campaign and got his life turned upside down by coming into in a touch with the living Christ, and it radically changed him. So much so that C.T. Studd ended up becoming a missionary and touched two continents with the gospel. And you want to talk about a guy, I don't want to get off track, but you want to talk about a guy who was just out and out for the Lord. C.T. Studd was just wholly given to God. Uh, he, was, he was what some people might call a radical, but really he was just all in for the Lord. He wrote a book, uh, you, you know books, he wrote a little book called The Chocolate Soldier. Have you ever seen The Chocolate Soldier? You can get it online, it's, I think it's free now, public domain. The Chocolate Soldier, and C.T. Studd, now he was rough. He said, I'm going to tell you what we've done. We've raised a whole generation of Christians who are not good soldiers of Jesus Christ. They're chocolate soldiers. They're nice to look at and they're really sweet, but when the heat gets turned up, they all melt pretty strong he married a girl named priscilla they thought that priscilla would tame him down a little bit priscilla was as radical for jesus as he was when they got married true story priscilla came down the aisle with her wedding gown and a banner across her white wedding gown that said united to do battle for jesus that's a woman right there let me tell you <laughs> ct and priscilla stud they were greatly used of god and this was early on. C.T. Studd was giving his testimony, and F.B. Meyer was in the meeting, and F.B. Meyer said, I was just taken with the touch of God on his life. And he said, when the meeting was done, he said, I made a beeline for the front. I got in line, and I shook that young man's hand, and I said to him, and C.T. Studd did not know who F.B. Meyer was. He said, I said to this young man, young man, you have something I don't have. What is it? 
And without any hesitation, C.T. Studd said, have you surrendered everything to Jesus Christ? And F.B. Meyer said, I was offended. He said, I threw my hands up, took a step back and said, of course, I'm a minister. He said, but when I left that night, I couldn't get away from his question. F.B. Meyer later said, I, I walked home alone by the river that night and all the way, the question haunted me. Have you really surrendered everything? I mean, everything. Not, not some things, not most things, not all the things people know about. Have you really surrendered everything to Jesus Christ? And this is Meyer's own words. He said, when he got to his house, he said, I took my ring of keys out of my pocket and I opened the door to my house and no one else was home. The lights were off. And he said, I stepped in to that dark house and closed the door behind me. He said, I had that ring of keys in my hand. And he said, at that moment, he said, the presence of Christ was so real. There was nobody in that house but me and Jesus. And he said, I could hear the Lord Jesus, not audibly, but in my heart. I could hear the Lord Jesus say to me, Meyer, I want the keys to your life. Funny how the Lord can use object lessons yet today. He's holding this ring of keys, and he said, of course, Lord, you, you got them all. And he said, I watched as the Lord Jesus, symbolically, of course, took the keys that I had given him and stood there in front of me and counted them one by one. And he said, then I heard the Lord say, there's one missing. And F.B. Meyer said, I argued with the Lord. And I said, Lord, that's just a little area of my life. That's, that's just the key to a little, little closet that I want to hang on to. I've given you everything else. I mean, look at all the good things I'm doing in my life for you. And the Lord Jesus said to him, Meyer, if I am not Lord of all, I am not Lord at all. And F.B. Meyer said at that moment, it was as if the presence of Christ and the joy of the Lord began to depart. And I said, Lord, don't leave me like this. And the Lord Jesus held out a nail-pierced hand and said, I want all the keys to your life. And F.B. Meyer later testified and said, that was the night. That was the night. Standing in the foyer of his house in that dark room, he said, I took the last lonely key of my life and placed it in the nail-pierced hand of Jesus. And F.B. Meyer said, my life was never the same again. With that in mind, I want you to open the Word of God with me. Would you please to the book of Titus? Anybody surprised we're going to Titus tonight? We lived here yesterday in three different meetings, and we returned to pick up right where we left off in Titus chapter number 2. And before I read, I want you to do something, all right? While I read, I want you to pay real close attention to every word because every word of Scripture is, is given by inspiration, and every word is profitable. But I want you to look for one word. I'll emphasize it as I read it. It's a word repeated. In fact, when I emphasize it, if you think you know what it is, circle it in your Bible. It shouldn't be hard to find. It's amazing how many times God used this word. In fact, I would argue it's one of God's favorite words. Would you like to know one of God's favorite words? Because He uses it a lot. And I'm going to preach a one-word sermon tonight. Some of you say, praise Jesus. This is going to be a quick message. No, probably not, but one word. Titus chapter 2, we looked at the opening verses already, the aged men, the aged women, and the young women and the young men. How many of you think you fall in one of those categories? Would you raise your hand, please? We all fall in one of those categories. And he says in verse number 7, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech, that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people 
zealous of good works, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. How many of you think you know the word? Do I need to read the whole thing again? What's the word? Say it, church. Yeah. What does that word mean? Somebody years ago said all means all, and that's all all means. That's pretty good, isn't it? It is an all-encompassing word. It is, it's the height and breadth and length and depth. God says, I want it what? When the Lord Jesus Christ died at Calvary and cried out from the cross, it is finished. May I say, he paid all of the sin debt in full. He didn't give part of himself. As a matter of fact, look down. Look down to verse number 14. The Bible says he gave himself for us. He didn't give something. He gave himself for us. I've written the margin of my Bible. He gave it all. When the Bible says he gave himself, he gave every drop of his blood and every ounce of his strength and every bit of his body and soul and spirit was yielded to the will of God to keep us out of hell. Jesus didn't hold back anything. He gave it all to the Father and he gave it all for us. And he did that so he could give us all of God's salvation. Don't you think that a God who gave all Deserves all. When we started our study yesterday, everybody remember? Look back at chapter 1, verse number 1. Do you see the last phrase of verse number 1? This book is about the truth which is after godliness. And we, we talked about the fact God doesn't just want us to know Him. He wants us to be like Him. He wants our lives to be conformed to His image. He wants godly people, not just people that say they know God. Pardon me. Not just people come to church on Sunday and check a box off. People that actually know God and their life makes Him known. Well, look at our text tonight. Look at chapter 2. And verse number 12, he says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. May I say to you, we are living in ungodly times, and we're surrounded by an ungodly culture, but God still wants his people to be godly people. And there's only one way that we can be godly. Would you like to know what it is? We have to give him all. Godliness is not dressing up for church. Sorry. Godliness is not carrying a Bible, knowing the hymns, knowing when to nod your head, or every now and then saying amen in church. That's not godliness. No. Godliness is, is not using all the religious cliches and patting each other on the back and say, well, God bless you. That's not godliness. In fact, that can be the furthest thing from godliness because that could be all about you or all about me. Do you know what ungodliness is? People say, yeah, it's... It's this immoral crowd. It's the abortion crowd. It's the whatever. No, the word ungodly means giving no regard to God. Did you know you could actually live your life as a Christian and be an ungodly person because you live your normal life without even thinking about God, with giving no regard to God? And on the reverse, what is godliness? It is to regard God, pardon me, not on Sunday, but all the days of your life. Not in, not in some areas, but in all the areas of your life. Not in what people see, but in all the secret places of your heart. The only way to be godly is to give God all. And so for a few moments, I want to walk through the alls with you. May I do that tonight? I'd like you to write them down. You've got them here. You can mark them in your Bible. But I'd like you to write them down because I want you to know when Jesus Christ bought and paid for you, he didn't buy part of you. He bought all of you. The day I got saved, 41 years ago, 41 years ago, I trusted Jesus as my Savior. He came to live in my life. It was the greatest decision ever made and the greatest day of my life. Do you, know, do you know I've never gone to bed a single night? Never. In 41 years, I've never gone to bed a single night and wished if I died during the night, I wouldn't go to heaven. Not a single time. Never. I've never woken up in the morning and thought I wished I wasn't a Christian today. It's never crossed my mind. You know why? Because there's nothing like knowing Jesus. But I want you to know that when the Lord Jesus Christ came into my life, he didn't rent, he bought for the record, he doesn't move in and out either. He moves in to stay. And when he moves in, he starts the largest remodeling project in the history of the world. He starts getting all your old furniture. You know that ratty couch? He wants that out of your life, you know. 
all that junk that doesn't bring him glory. He starts moving things out, and on the other door, he starts moving things in that look like Jesus. Do you know why? Because when Jesus Christ bought and paid for you, he paid for your spirit, he paid for your soul, he paid for your body, and he, he, he put his flag on your life and claimed every bit of it for himself. It is all rightfully his, and it should all be yielded to him. Imagine how strange it would be to buy a house. Imagine how strange it would be to buy a house. And you go to closing. If you've ever gone through this process, you go to closing and you sign the documents and they give you the keys and they give you the garage door opener and they give you all of that. And the owner across the table says, now, we, we know you're going to enjoy the place. You're going to have a great time. Here's the key to the front door and here's the key to the back door and here's the key to this and key to that. But we just want you to know that there is one little closet on the back of the house. We've always really liked that closet and we're going to keep the key to that. And it, look, we won't be in any trouble to you. We promise we won't be in any trouble. We're going to come and go every now and then, get things out of that closet and put things in that closet. But we won't bother you at all. We're all only keeping one little part of that house. You said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. I didn't buy a part of that house. I bought all of that house. Well, let me ask you a question. If we think that's ridiculous in our world, why do we give some space in our life that does not allow the owner, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be Lord of every area of our life? He deserves it what? Hmm. Well, let's walk through it, shall we? You have your pen in hand? You got your Bible? Let's begin right here in verse number 7. Would you mark in all things? Let's start with the all things just a minute. In all things. And then come down to verse number 9. Mark it again a second time. In all things. And one more time for good measure in verse 10. In all things. Would you like to guess what in all things means? This is deep. Are you ready? It means in all things. In every area of your life, the Lord wants to be glorified. Matter of fact, look at verse number 7. He says to the young men, In all things you show yourself a pattern of good works. Don't just say you're a Christian. Live like a Christian. Don't just use the name of Jesus. Live like a follower of Jesus Christ. Away with this weak, anemic, run-of-the-mill, lackadaisical, kind of half-hearted Christianity. Where are the people that say, I want to in all things show myself an example of what it means to be a Christian? And look at it, doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech. So he deals with actions and he deals with motives and he deals with words. Look at verse number 9. He speaks to the servants. He says, you be obedient to the people you work for and please them in all things. Don't smart mouth them. Don't answer back. Don't be lazy. Don't purloin. Look at the end of verse number 10, that you may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. How many of you believe the Bible? Let's try that one more time. How many of you believe the Bible? Let me ask you a question. Would anybody that watched your life today believe the Bible because of what they saw in you? Because that's what that verse means. That word adorn the doctrine literally means dress it up. Look, the doctrine of God is beautiful. There, there's nothing more beautiful than Jesus. But this is fascinating to me. He says you ought to live your life in such a way so when people look at your life, they think more of Christ, not less of Christ. They, they think highly of God, not low thoughts of God. They, they think all good things and not bad things. Not because you're perfect, but your life in all things. See, this is the height. God takes the natural life, the, the everyday life, the ordinary parts of life and he lifts it to the highest level that's what he does he makes all ground holy ground do you understand that your school campus is to be a place where Jesus is to be seen in your life in all things that on your job you say you don't know my job it doesn't matter you say you don't know my boss it doesn't matter that on the on the job site in your neighborhood in every business interaction, in every person you cross paths with, you're supposed to be lifting up the glory and goodness and grace of God and beautifying the truth and dressing it up in all things in such a way that when people see that, they say, I don't know what those people have, but I want to know their Christ. I need what that man or that woman exemplifies because in all things you are living the Christian life. I don't mean you're perfect. Every person in this room has failed today. Every last stinking one of us. Because we're all just a bunch of sinners. 
and we have to confess and we have to repent and we have to renew our vows with God and we have to forsake sin. But the reality is we should be so wholly given to God that we live our lives on purpose, intentionally, so that in all things people think more of our Christ. I remember years ago hearing the story of a little boy. I think it was in the Chicagoland area. He was just a boy living on the street and he had nothing holes in his shoes and tattered clothes, and it was winter. A very fine, wealthy, well-dressed woman came out of a big, beautiful department store with her fur coat and all of her regalia on. She saw the boy, and she had pity on him, and she said to him, Son, have you eaten today? He said, No, ma'am, not today. She said, You come with me. She walked him into one of those diners and sat him down in the corner booth and she gave him a menu and she told the waiter, she said, whatever he wants. And man, did he eat, let me tell you. He ordered almost one of everything and ate till he could eat no more. She said, you come with me. And they walked across the street back into that department store and she took him back into the boys' section. And she said to the man there, Put, give him new shoes and, and give him warm clothes and what's the best coat you have. And I mean, she outfitted him, paid for everything. The little boy had never been treated like that. He'd never had things like that before. He walking out of the department store, and he stopped and looked up at her, and he said, Madam, could I ask you a question? She said, son, certainly, son. He said, are you Jesus' mother? And she smiled, and she said, no. She said, but I am one of his children. He said, I knew you were related to him somehow. <laughs> when I heard that story, I thought to myself, I wonder if anybody I met today, anybody, would say, you know that man I waited on? He reminded me of Jesus. The way that man did business with me, it was different. He made me think of Jesus. Dear Lord, do such a deep work in our hearts that all things begin to bring you glory. Let's look at another one. He not only talks about the all things, but look at verse number 10. He says, not purloining, but showing all, would you write this down, fidelity, all good fidelity. You know what the word fidelity means? That's a word we don't use a lot. Sometimes it gets used in financial regions today. But fidelity means a conviction of something. Watch this. If all things is the height of God's work in us because it lifts all of life into His realm, set your affection on things above, then all good fidelity is the depth of God's work in us because it goes all the way to our hearts. The idea here of all good fidelity, it means that even in the mundane of life, even in the, in the everyday task, even in the junk you don't like, Even in that, you are doing it not for them but for Him. And every part of your life is done with this motive. I want the Lord to be pleased with my life. You know what's really interesting? He's talking to servants, literally people, many of them who are operating as as slaves, as people who are being even, even just laden down with burdens and having a hard time. And this is fascinating to me. Instead of trying to fix all the social ills of his day, instead of getting into the political fray of it all, you know what he does? He said to those believing servants, there ought to be such a spiritual power to your life that even those hardened unbelievers around you notice there's something different in your life. You know, if we give more attention to the spiritual and less to the social and the political, I think the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ would do something such a deep work in us, it would work its way out of us and change lots of other people around us with all good fidelity. It's a heart work. Is your Christianity just on the surface or is it heart deep? I must tell you that even as I'm preaching to you, I'm convicted. I'm preaching to myself and letting you listen tonight is what I'm doing. Am I doing what I'm doing from the heart? Am I... Am I just going through the motions? Do you know how easy it is for a preacher to get mechanical? Your pastor and I were talking today, and I told him, I I preach almost every day of my life. And, you know, honestly, when you're in meetings constantly, in and out, in and out, in and out, it's very easy to get mechanical. Let me just tell you, Jesus doesn't want any robot followers. Mm -mm. What he wants are people who are heart deep with the Lord Jesus, so in love with Christ, so passionately in pursuit of the Lord, that every area, all of their life reveals that heart-level passion. 
And so we have all things, that's the height. We have all good fidelity, that's the depth. Let me show you a third one. Look down to verse number 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to, mark this one down, all men. Now, now it turns inside out. Now it turns from Titus to the lost people around him, from, from the church in Crete to the unbelievers in Crete. Why is that? Because the heart of God is always a heart for all people. Matter of fact, let me just show you something. Go back a couple pages in your Bible, would you please? Go back with me to 1 Timothy for just a moment. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to show you this from Scripture. This is not my word. This is God's word. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 4. He's, he's talking about praying for people in authority and, and living quiet and peaceable and godliness and honesty. This is good, acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Look at verse number 4. Who will have, what's the next word, church? All men. All men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. That doesn't mean all people are going to be saved, but the heart of God is He wants them all to be saved. Somebody said, why are you such a whosoever will preacher? Because Jesus is a whosoever will Savior. God loves all people. Christ died so that all could be saved let me show you another. Go over to the, towards the end of your Bible to 2 Peter for just a minute. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9. When people ask you, give them Bible answers. Take them to the Word of God. Show them what Scripture teaches. What does God say about all men? Look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. Word. Stop just a second. Stop. You ever think about the word long-suffering? That's a word we don't use a whole lot. Would you like to know what it means? Somebody says, yeah, God's long-suffering. I think you missed it. Take the word long-suffering, chop it in half, and flip it around. It means he suffers long. Did you ever think about how much God puts up with from us? Look, you should be glad I'm not God. And I'm glad you're not God. If we were God, we'd squash each other like bugs every day. But God is merciful, God is gracious, God is patient, God is, look, long-suffering. Why is He long-suffering? Look at the verse. He's long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. Stop and look at me just for a minute, would you please? The next time somebody asks you why Christ hasn't come back yet, and they say, yeah, you Christians say Jesus is coming back, but we haven't seen any of that for the record. There's a whole lot of signs of the times going on right now that are rushing headlong towards the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But, but even if you don't believe all the signs, let me tell you the heart of God, why Jesus has not come back yet. There's only one reason stated in the Bible that Christ Christ has not showed up yet. Would you like to know what it is? He is giving men time and space to repent and get right with God. I'm going to tell you what that is. That's how much God loves sinners. And here's what, here it is. Look at the word. End of verse number 9. He doesn't want any to perish, but that, what's the next word, church? Oh, it just keeps popping up. All should come to repentance. As surely as we say, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. On the other side of that, we say that Christ wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants all men to come to repentance. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. I hear people tell others to go to hell. I want you to know, if you had a glimpse of what hell was like, you'd never say that. You wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy. Sometimes, sometimes even us Bible-believing Christians get so annoyed with this lost world and we almost just kind of smirk and say, yeah, well, they're, they're going to get what they deserve. Friend, we all deserve hell. You understand, if it wasn't for the grace of God, we'd all be in hell right now or on our way to hell. And the only reason we're not there and never going there is because of the long-suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ. Next time you're annoyed at a sinner. By the way, why should we get annoyed at sinners for acting like sinners? I mean, seriously, like we're surprised they act like sinners? Let me tell you what you ought to do. You ought to turn that anger into compassion. You ought to ask God to melt your hardness. And instead of getting mad at them and letting flesh answer to flesh, you ought to weep for them. You ought to pray for them. You ought to seek their salvation because the heart of God is He wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. If all things is the height of God's work and and all fidelity is the depth of God's work, then all men, I love this, is the breadth of God's work. What does he want? He wants everybody to come to him and be saved. 
Go back to Titus with me, would you please? Look at this breadth. It's the breadth of grace. That's what it is. Look at verse 11, 12, and 13. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. So in verse 11, you've got grace bringing. In verse number 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So now you've got grace teaching. So the same grace that brings Jesus to you begins to teach you how to be a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, God doesn't just save you from something. He saves you for something. God doesn't just save you to keep you out of hell someday. God saves you so you can know Jesus and follow him today. And then verse number 13, you got grace looking, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know what we ought to pray? We ought to be praying, Lord, lift all the things of my life onto your holy level. Lord, do the deep work in all fidelity in my heart so all of my soul and inner man is as after Christ. And then, Lord, give me your heart and compassion for all men and for all people. Oh, Lord, do this all-encompassing work in my life. Who are you praying for to be saved? Who? You say you want people to be saved. Who? I ask sometimes in churches, give me the name of somebody you're praying for. Friend, when we can't even think of a lost person's name, something's wrong. Where's our burden? Where's our passion? Where are our tears? Where's our compassion after the lost? Who's on your prayer list? Who are you pursuing right now for the Lord Jesus Christ? Who will stand at the judgment seat someday and point to you and say, that man led me to Jesus. That woman prayed me to God. That family stayed after me till I got saved. Who will you take to heaven with you? Because the heart of God is a heart for all men. Let's look at another. You see them here? You've got all things and all good fidelity and all men. And then come down to verse number 14. Now this is about to get down where we live. Lord, help us. Who gave himself for us, and we like that. Don't we love to talk about that? Sure, we just had Easter and celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and we all want to sit around and talk about how great it is. We're just glad to be saved. Well, keep reading. That, here's God's great purpose statement. He might redeem us from what? All iniquity. And purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. You know, some people, they just want enough salvation to keep out of hell someday. They don't want the Lord to mess with their life today. But I want you to know, when Jesus saved you, he bought and paid for all of you. And you know what he wants to get out of it? All iniquity. In fact, yesterday we talked about iniquity. Everybody remember that? The crooked thing that only God can straighten out. The Lord says, I want to find every crooked thing in you. Every crooked thing in you. Every crooked thing in you. And I want to get that out of your life. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be, oh, any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. If all things is the height of his work and all fidelity is the depth of his work and all men is the breadth of his work, then all iniquity is the length of his work. You see all the dimensions of God's work in our life? What lengths did Christ go to? He went all the way to Calvary so he could get all of the sin out of your life. So may I ask you a personal question that only you can answer? What's the besetting sin of your life? You know the one. You waiting on me to call it? I can't call all the sins. I don't know all the sins. I know mine. What's the pet sin in your life? You know the one you keep excusing. And you say something like this, well, I'm not as bad as I used to be. Well, I'm better than she is. I mean, you know, you know, preacher, everybody's got something. Mm -hmm. I hear people say, that's just the way I am. Well, it doesn't mean it's the way you're supposed to be. I want you to know, when Jesus Christ died on that cross, he died for that sin. That sin put him on the cross. You stop looking at your sin and start looking at the cross, you'll think different about your sin. What's the crooked thing that while we're trying to walk in the straight and narrow way, we're trying to hold on to that thing? The Lord says, no, 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 I want to get all of that out of your life so that anything that doesn't look like Jesus and bring God glory and allow the Holy Spirit to do His work in your life, all of that is removed from your life. 
I don't know about you. I can't wait to get to heaven and get a new body. Anybody else looking for a new body? And not just a new body. He's going to make all things new. Isn't it going to be nice when you don't have to deal with the devil anymore? And this old sin-cursed world and your own fleshly lust that war against the soul. Man, I'm looking forward to it. But until that day, you're going to have to let the Lord work in you to get all of the iniquity out of your life. And somebody says, well, preacher, I don't know what right anybody has to tell me that. I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. Would you look at the last one in verse 15? These things speak and exhort and rebuke with what? All authority. Do you know what the greatest struggle in life is? Who gets to be the boss? No, I'm serious. Like in a marriage, and I don't want to start any wars here right now, but in a marriage, like who gets to decide, right? In churches, who gets to be in charge? In, in government, who gets to be the person that calls? The, isn't that right? I mean, it's always the struggle of the will. May I just tell you, the same thing's true in your Christian life. Somebody's going to have the authority. Somebody's going to be the master. Somebody's going to be the Lord. Somebody is going to sit on the throne, and you're going to have to decide who it's going to be. And Paul wrote to Titus and said, when you preach this and teach this in the local church, I want you to do it with all authority. And it's not Paul's authority, and it's not Titus's authority, and it's not my authority, and it's not your pastor's authority. I'm speaking tonight on the authority of the Word of God, and I came to say that every sincere Christian must submit themselves to the authority and lordship of Jesus Christ. And, and not in some areas, in what? You know the word. If all things is the height of his work, and all fidelity is the depth of his work, and all men is the breadth of his work, and all iniquity is the length of his work, then watch this, all authority is the circumference of his work. It is every part of my life. There is not a single part of my life that does not rightfully belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. I am His by creation. He made me. I am His by sustaining. He keeps me. I am His by redemption. He paid for me. I am His by His Lordship. He rightfully owns every part of my life. And the sooner I get to His authority and my submission, the greater all of my life will be. And I wonder tonight, what's the last lonely key? I know. I know you gave him most of them. What's that worth? What's that worth? You know, we sing a lot of lies in church. Did you know that? Yes, we do. We sing that song, All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. Would you take your hymn book out? Do you have a hymn book there near you? Take a hymn book out. If you'll, if you'll take a hymn book out, I'll make a deal with you. I promise not to sing to you, all right? You've heard of singing preachers? You have a singing preacher. I'm not one, all right? Would you find hymn 489 in your hymn book? Here it is. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. Look at the words. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus. Take me now. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou art mine. You live in there? I'm not asking you to know the song. I'm asking, is this your testimony? Would you look in the top left-hand corner? Do you see that name there? Judson W. Vandeventer. I have sung this hymn all of my life and never paid any attention to that man's name. Any of you ever paid any attention to his name? Never, never really thought about it. You know, there's a story behind every song. Sometimes we know them, sometimes we don't. Can I tell you about old Judson? Judson, at 17 years of age, got saved. He was 17. Heard the gospel, trusted Christ as his Savior, became a Christian. He was brilliant. He was in a university, great university, finishing a degree, became a teacher. He was so musically gifted, they said he mastered 13 instruments. 13. Writing music, teaching, involved in the arts, bright future. 
And then Judson said he came to the great crisis hour of his life. And the great crisis hour was whether he was going to let God have it all. And he said, to be honest with you, I struggled because I wanted to keep part of it. I wanted to draw my lines and keep God in my box and, and do what I wanted to do and still say, well, I'm a Christian. I, I'm following Jesus. And Judson Van Deventer said he finally came to the place where he said, all right, Lord, I'm not going to fight you anymore. And Judson Van Deventer became an evangelist and wrote the words of this song. May I read to you what he said? He said, for some time I had struggled between developing my talents in the field of art and going into full-time evangelistic work. At last, the pivotal hour of my life came and I surrendered all. He said, a new day was ushered into my life. I became an evangelist and discovered down deep in my soul a talent hitherto unknown to me. God had hidden a song in my heart and touching a tender chord, he calls me to sing. And the song that God had hidden in his heart was the song you're looking at right now. Would you look at the last verse of it? All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessings fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. And tonight, I came to ask every person in this room, if you would be willing to give yourself, not part, all, to the one who gave himself, for you. Father, I thank you for Jesus. Lord Jesus, I thank you for giving it all. And I pray tonight that by the work of the Holy Spirit in every heart, there may be in this meeting a spirit of sweet surrender an ultimate submission to all the will of God. If this Bible message has been used of God in your life, or we can pray for you in some definite way, please contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. We hope you will share the message with others who may also be encouraged by it. For additional full-length Bible messages, please visit Dr. Scott Pauley's YouTube channel. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day, and we want to encourage you to be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church in your area this Sunday. Thank you for listening to The Weekend Pulpit, and don't miss Enjoying the Journey daily devotional podcast each Monday through Friday.